um, for everyone, but the idea is, is to try to get geometers uh, having some um, new uh, ideas about what this is. Uh, okay, so the first a bit of physical motivations. Um, so the important question in GR for a very long time was the notion of making sense of an isolated systems. Um, so, it's, so you should think really of a box, right? And of course, it's very useful in usual physics because then you're sort of um, going from your complicated physics to something that you have under control, uh, smaller system. And then once you sort of make sense of this, you can, uh, because it's isolated, you can make sense of charges, perhaps energy of this system. And then in a second term, in a second time, you can make sense of fluxes uh, of uh, things going into your system. Uh, and of course, uh, the way you do this in the rest of in other physics field is that you use your metric to make sense of the box. You start at one point, you go, let's say, one meter long, one meter high, one meter deep, you have a box, and you have some fill in there, it defines your system. Of course, in GR, uh, the notorious problem is that precisely uh, the field which is going to define the box, the metric, is, is the same field which is defining uh, which you want to measure, whose flux you want to measure. So this uh, was um, uh, the problem. And, um, and the notion of asymptot asymptotically flat space-time precisely has been devised to sort of solve to pro to this problem, to make sense, in a, you know, to solve these difficulties. Um, so, and, and because of this idea also, because really what you're trying to make sense is system with charges and fluxes, your history of this field uh, is tightly related to the history of uh, gravitational waves and in the sense of trying to make sense uh, for a very long time, a closely related question was, uh, is there an, an invariant meaning uh, to the notion of gravitational radiation? Um, and also, this can also be seen as trying as solving this problem. Okay, so there is a very long history of this field, which I'm not going to review. Uh, the idea is really to give you the end geometrical picture of this. Um, the historical landmark was these classical papers by GMS. There are two papers, one from Sachs alone and the other for um, this gentlemen. Um, then Penrose, just a few years after, he, he realized that you can understand this, um, uh, the result of, um, of this guy uh, in uh, this geometrical picture of formal compactification and really clarified the under underpinning geometrical setting. Um, okay, and then there is a long story before that and after that, uh, which I think uh, one first entry point is Fraudiner's review. And there are two papers which are very nice. Also, there is Kenefic book, which is more uh, uh, this book on history of science. It tells you about this long uh, question of whether or not gravitational waves are physical. Um, so, what is the thing I want to say? Yes. So again, the idea is that um, is is to present this in a geometrical fashion. So I'm really going to follow in spirits uh, Gerard's lecture notes and not BMS, uh, but also um, HTK's. Um, to, to the nice um, presentation of the subject. And also I should say that in the last years, there's been this um, realization that uh, asymptotic symmetries are also uh, interesting feature at quantum level that you can make sense of them as being symmetries of the X matrix. And there is a long uh, a story um, um, that is, so you can find ideas on this uh, in Strominger's book. And I try. And yeah, so, so I'm obviously not going to talk about this at all, but uh, I'd like to give you some of the underlying geometrical uh, thing going on in, in trying to make sense of what is, how can you make sense of the notion of gravity vacua uh, in an invariant way. Um, and these, these are uh, everywhere in, in, this, in, this, in this sort of work. Okay, so this is my, my introduction. So let's start with conformal compactifications. <clears throat> So, so one conformal compactification of Minkowski space. So of course, in this field, uh, there is not really where you can discuss asymptotically flat space-time without making sense in, in which sense Minkowski space is conformally compact. Uh, and so, let me introduce a bit of notation. So, y mu is going to be just y zero, y one, y two, y three. And then we have a metric, Lorentzian, that in this case, dy is, uh, so it's one mu, y mu, theta mu, mu, which is just what you expect, right? y squared plus g squared plus g. Okay, um, and here, so, yes. Ah, okay, I see. 
So bigger, yeah. Um, okay, so these are just coordinates on Minkowski space in the flat metric on Minkowski space. Now I'm going to try to write that bigger. Um, okay, now um, here I'm going to slightly depart from the tradition and, and introduce the conformal compactification from the ambient space perspective. So we are going to, and this is really in, full, in the spirit of uh, Michael Eastwood talk. So you introduce two extra coordinates. So now mu minus, now this is an R42. And we have a big, bigger metric here. I'm going to y, i, j, h, i, j equal d two d y plus d y minus plus y mu so theta mu. Okay, so we're adding two directions and they are null for this big ambient metric. Um, okay, what do I do? Yes. So an essential remark, Um, is that if you pick, so now we pick some some vector in this R42, which is just going to be this one, 0, 0, 1, which I'm loosely going to refer to as being infinity tractor, so it's in R42 again. And in particular, you see just by this formula, its norm is 0, just because it's just y plus, y minus. Uh, then, if you, then you can think of the Poincare group. So let me write B. ISO 31, which is R4, and ISO 31, as being just the stabilizer of this guy, sitting inside SO42. Okay, so there is an SO42 matrix here. You act with SO42 on this object, but if you look for the subset stabilizing this object, this is mean you get the point I group. And indeed, so, and here, all the group, like this here. And indeed, uh, let me write this right. And in fact, is that so you can consider the following embedding R three one my new going to uh, this R four two mm -hmm. like this one my new minus one alpha. And this is in this space, space of y is in R42. Okay, I need a bit room for later on. So that's y squared equals zero and y dot i equal one. And so the fact is that this is a isometric embedding. This is isometry. Okay, so let me draw a picture for what is going on here. Um, so we have this amiant space here. I want to keep the picture. What we are doing is we are considering. So this is R four two. We are considering the null cone in here. This is really something like this. Of course, I'm I'm really going to miss dimension in this drawing, but I will try. Okay, so this is this null cone. But now we are picking in there some slice, so that's why that i is one. Here, so y squared equals zero. Yes, let me read it. So what? So y squared equals zero. So you're in this null cone, but also you want uh, h of y i equal one. So we have this. We pick this i here. We have a metric, and we want this. So, you know, this is just computing this y plus. It's just, this is just this one on this. So how is this in this picture? So let's, let's pretend this is i, and then there is this hypersurface here, which is going to intersect the null cone somewhere here. 
Okay, so there is this slice catch. In fact, so if you want this fact is that this slice is just is just Minkowski space that you embedded in there. So it's just M through one. Of course, here we are missing dimension. Also, this this picture is Riemannian while while, while everything is Lorentzian in, in this guy. So so yeah. So it's, but you have to believe me that this is the right intuition. So what is this this fact that you have this submanifold? There is a metric in this R for two. You restrict it to this slice. This is just a metric of Minkowski space. So, yeah, so this fact is that this is an isometric embedding. Sorry? This section should then be tilted at 45 degrees, like parallel to one of the. Yes, because I is known. But, is it what you mean, right? Yeah. Yes, but, um, <laughs> so this here is a problem of missing dimensions, you see. So you have to believe me that this is, this is the right picture if you want to have good intuitions. Because, I mean, here we are missing dimension and everything is. So we're missing dimension also right. Okay, so now, now where is conformal compactification? So now let's define the conformal compactification of Minkowski space as being this object. So M31 is bar now, the conformal compactified Minkowski space is which? Which space? So it's a space of Y's eyes in R42 star. So this star means non-zero. Y is non-zero. Sorry. Bigger. Yep. I can. The space of Y in R for two star such that Y squared equals zero. So in this null cone, but now and then you quotient by R star. And this is this lives in in a quadric now RP five. Um, so what is this object in the picture? Oh, this is just this is the null cone, right? This is the quotient in null cone. So this is this 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 picture. I just don't want to uh, don't want this. It means just that y is non zero. Just 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 want to take out this uh, uh, the tip of the cone. Otherwise things get annoying. Okay, um, ta -da -da. so a bunch of facts related to this guy. So topologically, this is just, so we, right, this, this bar is just S1 times S3 divided by plus or minus one. Um, yeah. And this object is conformal. So the, the ambient metric induces a conformal metric here. So, yes. What's the plus minus one? You need to divide, you see, because here you're quotienting by R star, you need to divide by plus or minus one. And the division, the portion, okay. Yes, quotient by plus or minus one. Okay, um, yeah, so this object is, uh, in fact, is, is, is conformally uh, round model, conformal manifold. Okay, so yes. Um, so SO42 and the other point, important point is that now we have the SO, the so SO42 is the I mean, acts on the subtle space, it acts on the cone, so it acts actually transitively, acts transitively, and therefore this object is an homogeneous basis for this group. Okay. Okay. Yeah, P is is R four. Okay. Now, what you can do is now you can project. So right, we had this slice. Now what we are going, what you can easily do now is that now you can project here. So now you are looking the projective cone. So you identify all the points which are sitting in the same generator. Now this point is identified with this one, this one is identified with this one, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So what this telling you is that you can now project on this M bar three one. We have this isometric embedding of Minkowski space. Now you can project, the way I'm going to write it is just that you uh, 
uh, use homogeneous coordinates now. And of course, and this is a conformal embedding. New question on this picture, or things clear? Of course, what is going on here? You are, so this part of the picture is identified because we are quotienting by uh, all R's, but so we you see what this identification, what it does is that it's really identifying our Minkowski space with this half circle, but we are definitely missing this point here. So, That nearly done. And so you see in the picture, the point that we are missing, really they are, they would be the point at infinity. There is the, they are the asymptotes, right? There's some asymptotes here. We are missing here, but in the conformal compactification now is just, just, it's just the boundary. So we do see the boundary of Minkowski space now, or the conformal boundary. Um, so, what is more or less clear from this picture is, as we have the following decomposition of the conformal compactification. So you have a bit, which is just the intersection of your null cone. So y squared equals zero, such that y dot i is non-zero. And so this is this part, right? And by this fact above, this is just, this is conformally uh, isometric to your Minkowski space. And then there is another part, which is the intersection with the part which is zero, which you know, whose inner product with the infinity tractor is zero. Y squared equals zero and Y dot I equals zero. Now, formally, this is the boundary of your conformal compactification. This is this point here, right? Here, y dot i, I. this is zero. Okay, so, so now we are, we've sort of added to Minkowski space, the boundary of uh, Minkowski space, formally. So now, what is the structure of this boundary? So it's a fact, you can just, so in fact, this object is not manifold. Uh, and what happens is that we have the following decomposition so what I'm going to write boundary of M31, uh, in fact, is split into two parts. So there is a part cry, which is a manifold. This cry is a three-dimensional manifold, which is topologically um, S2 times R. And then this, and then this is just some point. Oops. So what is going on is that, yes? Ah, yes, yeah, sorry, so yes, yeah, yeah, intersection. So it's clear that there are two cases, right? Either your inner product is non-zero or your inner product is zero. So it's clear that you split this uh, informal compactification into bits, yes. However, again, this is not a manifold, but so essentially what this is, so if you're trying to draw a picture, so it's S2, there is, it's S2 times R, this is a sphere, S2 times R, and then at the end of it, it sort of collapses into a point, and these points, they are identified. So here, sort of your manifold structure is, gets, gets bad. Okay. Yes. Uh since the, the total is compact and you have no boundary, then uh, in that picture, you should glue the boundary to itself as well, right? Here. Yes, yes the point, this is one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but also the boundary itself, the scry, should be glued to itself. I think it's uh, future infinity is glued to past infinity. Sure. Is that I mean, yes, I think here, yeah, just in, this is S2 times R. Just one piece of scry, which you should do like this. Yes, indeed. So here, everything is a bit of a collapse in this picture. Indeed, if you're thinking that you have Minkowski with respect to the future of time infinity and the past point, they are all identified here. This is why the boundary is just one manifold. You don't have two or something like that. 
You might want, if you only question in by R, you can try only question by R plus. And then what you get is you have two copies of Minkowski space. Uh, so it's so really you have this picture with two, two copies of Minkowski space that get glued along uh, the infinities. So you can try to do this, but it's simple just at this point. Question by question and press. Um, okay, so let's uh, start. Um, so what, what we gain here? So also, so we, it was clear that this conformal compactivity, this conformally compactified Minkowski space is uh, is a homogeneous space for S two for two. It's called these homogeneous spaces. But now uh, we, for order to make sense of this, all of this, we have to introduce a bit more structures. So this infinity factors to stabilize the Poincaré group. So in fact. Uh, what is what is not a fact is that this decomposition here, so which decomposition? So m three one bar equal m three one. So now I'm loosely going to write this. All right. So this is a decomposition of the orbit of the Poincaré group. So iso three one acts transitively. Uh, on each of these pieces. So what does it mean? So we already, I mean, it's already classical statement that Minkowski space indeed is just ISO 31 divided by ISO 31. Point is a point, so it's trivial, but then you also have scry, which is ISO 31 divided by P, where P is R4, R3, uh, times R, times ISO2. Uh, ISO2 is the group of isometry of R2. Okay? So you just sort of, sort of very clear from this picture. Okay? So by introducing with this infinite tractor, we decompose this informally compactified space into orbits for the Poincaré group. One is Minkowski space. One is conform boundary, and then you have some other points. Okay, so this is the flat model. Um, of course, if, if you know uh, AGS or if you know hyperbolic space, you should probably compare this with, where should I, should I write this? Um, this appeared there. So it's just a remark, but perhaps it helps. So compare is H4, so hyperbolic space is just SO41 divided by SO4. And its boundary, S3, is O1 divided by P, where P is R3. Times it's a very similar picture, it's just that because we're flat, some, some things sort of degenerate at the boundary. Uh, and so, yeah, perhaps this is what I should say. So this is clearly Lorentzian geometry. We know well, no, this is Riemann, conformal Riemannian geometry. Uh, this is, no, this is, sorry, this is Riemannian geometry. This is conformal Riemannian geometry. Minkowski space is Lorentzian geometry and the type of conformal geometry induced at null infinity, in fact, is some very strange type of Informal geometry is called conformal Carolian geometry, and this is where what I'm going to discuss now. Some type of degenerate version of, of, of your usual conformal geometry. Okay. Very good. Now let's go to the curved situation. Is there any question on this, on the flat model before we, we do it into curved situation, the curved one? Like the universality of this conclusion. So here to add boundary, you have to like 
maybe this auxiliary construction with ambient space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe someone produces you for you another construction which gives another result to the um, Yeah, so yeah, I think this is the model for the conformal compactification of Minkowski space. Perhaps is what you're asking. So you could imagine having other type of compactification, projective compactification, something you can. Some other way of compactifying Minkowski states, and of course, this picture is not going to tell you anything about this. But then you have to understand how things are related. Right? This is the model for the conformal compactification. Yes. Yes. So can we perform the same construction in higher heat? Yes, it's very sensitive in the dimension. Just for 4G, you just need to do this. Even and then? Even and then? Yeah, everything is completely. Uh, Sorry, but uh, just to follow up, uh, what about uh, claims that there's less? Even in yes. odd, uh, odd dimensions? Uh, conformal computation doesn't exist. Okay, so I think what people mean by this, first of all, they mean that it doesn't exist when you have gravitational equations. So no, you have conformal computation are complicated. Also, I think what people mean when they say this, they mean that conformal computation are non-smooth, meaning that your uh, you know, matrix is, is a sum of terms that you put in the critical game. But at the, the homogeneous model is always the same. Okay, so now asymptotically flat space time. So now let me just give you the general definition. Let's see, I'm just after Penrose 1965. So let I'm going to write MP GP. P stands for physical. Uh, so um, a four-dimensional space-time. So Lorentzian manifold. Um, it it is asymptotically simple if the following old. So it's not asymptotically flat at this time, it's just simple. So what do you what do you need? You need that there exists, if there exists, if there exists uh, M another manifold with a conformal class of metric, Mg. So now this manifold has boundary, such that the following hold. Uh, so M physical, G physical, is conformally isometric to the interior. So to at. Okay, so this manifold has boundary, but now we want our physical space time to be conformally isometric to the interior of it. And we want a bit more. We want there exists an equivalence class of object, so G omega. So omega now is a function, the is a function on M. Here, so we have the following equivalence class. You are allowed to rescale things by lambda square. Okay, well, lambda is lambda is a function on M. No, we are vanishing, crucially, and such that so uh, omega is zero at the boundary, and perhaps you want precisely the boundary. So you want this to be a boundary defining function. So the boundary is points where omega is zero, but g omega is non-zero. And then what's more, you want so that, that, that. yes. Is d omega well defined at the boundary? Yes, because omega is zero. So if you go back to this case, then 
No, no, no. The question is just differentiability at the boundary. Yes, so I think this definition I'm required. I think I'm, I'm thinking of omega as being a smooth function on, on M. You know, so yeah, M has a boundary, no? Or what? Sorry. M has a boundary, no? M has a boundary. Yeah. Omega is everywhere defined, it goes to zero at the boundary, it's smooth, it's just G and it's a one sided limit or what is it? Boundary, no? I don't know. I mean, it, it, it locally extends across the boundary, but the okay. extension is irrelevant. So that's the usual notion of smoothness for functions on, on manifolds with boundary. Okay. Okay. Nice. Okay. the question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you're wondering about differentiability, all your problems should pro you, probably you, want, you, know, you might ask how much differentiability I want for G, and then that's a, there is a real modification. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll comment briefly on this very soon. Um, so what, yeah, so last point is that you want G physical to be just omega minus two G, right? And this makes sense because you rescale lambda two. This clearly is invariant under this rescaling and so, so on the interior, right? On, and okay, so just, let me just, just to motivate this definition. So one part is sort of clear, which was given by this thing. Uh, one uh, one interval less clear is, uh, is is this omega. So let me just write the MS coordinates once uh, to motivate this. So if this is your right, the R squared plus R squared H is two. So if this is Minkowski um, flat Minkowski space time, you can introduce U retarded time, and then omega is R minus one, and then you'll find out just by running through the computation that you have one, this is equal to one over omega squared, two du d omega plus uh, the matrix of the two sphere plus minus uh, omega squared d du omega. Okay, so this is the flat case example is precisely like this. And, this. and, uh, yeah, and by the way, these are called BMS coordinates and they are ubiquitous in this, uh, in this, in this setting. Okay, um, da -da -da. Yeah, so a bunch of important free market at this stage. Yes? I'm just confused between MP, M, and M. So, MP is M physical. So this is your physical space time. M is my manifold with boundary. M dot is the interior. M is just M dot plus GM. But anyway, see this first line telling you that it should be conformally isometric. So now you can forget about M dot. M is M dot is M physical. So you're just adding the boundary to your physical space time. Oh. M is boundary. The entire is So here uh, in this definition, I'm really trying to emphasize that G physical is unique. There's just one physical space time, but however, G and omega are not. Right, we are working with some equivalence classes just because this, this compactification is conformal. So there is some freedom in, 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 uh, in uh, rescalings. So when, of course, whenever omega is non-zero, you, you should, you know, if you're a physicist, you should think of this omega as being a Huckelberg field or compound center field. So when, whenever omega is non-zero, what you can do is you, you can choose the representative where, 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 um, where, where, where omega is one, right? And then what you get is just G physical. Of course, when omega is zero, you're just not allowed to do this. And then, uh, so yeah, let me write just this, omega. So in particular, this is what happened at the boundary. At the boundary, what you have is that you have the restriction of this metric at the boundary, but then you have zero. So this is really conformal geometry at the boundary. So H is the pullback of H of G star. 
So yeah, there's no. Okay, so in particular, from this picture, it's clear that the boundary is always conformal, nowhere around that. So you cannot fix any scale at the boundary, yes. You didn't correct to say that you are, so you really like in two theoretical terms, you can see the metric and omega, omega is compensated fields, so your conformance is kind of fake, but it's convenient to use different gauges. So you, inside, this is just this. Because at the boundary, because omega goes to zero, you have total amounts. So you see, it's convenient to do this precisely because now the whole picture extends to the boundary without uniform. So if you want short gauge that you want to choose, it only makes sense in the bulk, it doesn't make sense at the boundary. So you should try to fix this gauge or if you have trouble getting to the boundary. Um, okay, so, so we have a bit more. Uh, so there is this conformal metric at the boundary, but we, we have a bit more, there is a, there is a normal. How do we define this? The normal is just going to be g minus one. So am I using indices now? Well, no, okay, so let's not use indices. g minus one of g omega. Okay, so g omega is this boundary function. Take g minus one, it's a vector field. And the way it rescales, you can easily check that, okay. Let me just, so in fact, what we have is that hn, the way they rescale is like this. Okay, so it's quite easy to see. This gets rescaled by lambda minus two. This is lambda, so all, all together this gets rescaled by lambda minus one. So you have this equivalence class of object living at the boundary. This is a weighted normal. Um, okay, now the remark. Um, yes, yeah, so you know the norm is conformal invariance. This is pretty clear. And so this makes sense. You can think of this, you know, so is conformal, is, is invariant. You can make sense of the norm of this, and therefore you can have the following definition. Uh, I have, so yeah, I should say, if you care about differentiability in this, in this question, the, the setting the question is all, you know, might be, you might be concerned about how much differentiability you want G to have at the boundary. I really advise, if you care about these sort of things, I really love like reading Friedrich reviews um, on, on the back, it's called peeling, peeling or not peeling. I think it's, it's really illuminating on these questions. In particular to the extent, you know, if you're wondering how much this is physical or this sort of things. Okay. Um, yeah, so now this is an environment. So now we have the following definition. So this was just asymptotically flat. Now you can make sense of, you know, this was asymptotically simple. Now you can, we can have asymptotically AGS flat of the sitter. Here you are. So then what you need is that, so if you take M G omega asymptotically simple, and you on top of that, you're going to require the following things. Um, so the connected component of the boundary cry. So in general, this cry is going to have different connected components. Yes. Uh, and so this, this is going to be S3 or S2 times R or S1 times S2. And you want G physical to be Einstein. And you also want that now N squared as some sign, some fixed sign, okay? So now it's asymptotically flat or the sitter or the sitter. It's uh, so perhaps you okay, so let's let's fix this. And this is what this would not be necessary. This is always implied by the other by the other points. It's just that this the value of this normal is what discriminate between those those three cases. So now we are going to do the flat case. So lambda is zero everywhere. Yes. Is the n the normal you already defined? Yes, so yes, yes. yes. Okay, um, so we have time just to do what I want. All right. Now it's sort of clear what is going on. How much structure we have at the boundary? Uh, 
Like, so yeah, for the definition, for Boolean manifold, here on this definition, I'm really following uh, Uval Edwards poverty. So they have this nice paper. So conceptually, I think everything was around for a very long time, but sort of they give name to things and it's sort of conceptually clarifying. So, um, so conformal current manifold is the following data. Try and then HN is formally Carolian. If you have the following, so H is a conformal degenerate metric, is a conformal degenerate metric with, the, with, with one dimensional kernel. We have a weighted vector field, this guy. Weighted in the sense that you should quotient like this, and it's 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 nowhere vanishing, and it should span your. So let me just write in this is here. It should span the degenerate kernel, so it is in the kernel. You want your compatibility condition in the sense that you want this degenerate metric to be uh, its linear derivative should be zero with your uh, along the flow. Um, and what's more, you want that the line that this n generates, you want them to be uh, to form a fiber bundle. So integral line of n form a fiber bundle. So there is cry and it fibers over some manifold sigmas. <clears throat> Very good. So it's sort of fixing the overall topology here. Sorry? Great. No, this one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, then, okay. So do you have any question about this definition? Sort of very simple in some sense. Just degenerate version of what you would like conformal geometry like. Um, yes, so in particular, of course, remark is that by, by all this, no, I don't, yes. So the remark, is that of course, what this means is that you, this metric, because it's degenerate, it's, it's relatively zero, so it goes to the quotient. So in particular, uh, sigma H is a conformal manifold. Okay, so now BMS, here we are. So it's clear that any asymptotic, asymptotic flat space time is going to, to have this type of geometry induced by, by this remark I just make. <clears throat> now, definition slash proposition. <laughs> yes. What is the signature? So I think here I'm really thinking, well, I think you could do whatever you want, but I have really in mind that H is Riemannian. So this object is a conformal Riemannian object. So as you go to the question, it's Riemannian. Now, so we call BMS sigma. Now, remember that the sigma is a conformal manifold. Um, and then the group, so this is just going to be the group of automorphism of this structure. By which we mean, this is the space phi of diffeomorphism of scry to scry, such that Phi star of H, phi star of N equal phi HN. Okay, so you have this structure, you look for automorphisms, uh, very clear. 
it's a fact, if you want part of this proposition, that in fact, EMS sigma uh, is isomorphic to weight one functions. I'm going to explain what this is trying to say. Uh, semi-direct product with the conformal group of this conformal manifold. Yeah, this is conform manifold. You can look for the conform group of it. Um, this is these are weights one function on this conform manifold. There is a canonical action, and here it is. Uh, but so in coordinates, sure, sure. Afraid of what this means. This this, this transmutation means it's very 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 concrete. All that this means is that this is you should think of it. You can think of it as being so if if f is inside this is a section of this bundle. What this means is that really f is is a infinity function. Just that now, if uh, if phi is a conformal automorphism, lambda of omega, I'm saying omega squared h. Well, the way this phi is going to act on f, so this action is defined to be omega uh, phi star f. So you just you don't just act omega minus one. You don't you just don't. You should not just act with pullback, you act with pullback and you multiply. That's all this means that this is a weighted function. So this, there's a twist in the way this acts. Um, so practically, practically what? How do you realize this isomorphism? So the way you realize this homomorphism is that you, you choose trivialization. So what this means is you identify its cry with sigma times r. Of course, it's a choice. The way you do this is that if you have a point here, you're going to write it as u, u and z. Well, sigma, yeah, well, is it? Yeah, sigma times z. Uh, so this is a point z, this is u. Okay, so you're just writing in coordinates. And then the way it acts. So if I have my, yeah, so my this big phi, which is an element of the BMS group, the way it will act is as follows: times an r times sigma to r times sigma. So recall, so this phi, uh, I claim that in fact, in this set of coordinates, you can ident identify it with the function psi together with a function phi and phi. Uh, goes from sigma to sigma is a conformal isomorphism. Okay, I claim that you can act on here, and here is how we do this. So it's u, z, and it get maps to omega. It's omega of z, u minus psi minus phi of z. Phi. So the action on the base is clear. You're just acting with this conformal transformation. In the fibers, what's going on is that you're translating this function u, but there is a twist because things are weighted. So there's a slight twist here. Um, so should the structure here should be, I think, yeah, yeah. the structure of this group, of course, was related to the structure of the fiber bundle. Uh, it's clear that because this uh, group is automorphism of this fiber bundle structure, it should induce um, uh, you know, uh, automorphism on the base, which is this, this conformal part. Uh, but you can then, so you always have a projection, right? So you always have this projection BMS, sigma, the conformal group. This part is sort of clear, but then you can look at the zero. Um, so projection in coordinates is just, you forget about this, just forget about this, you just keep this F, this Y. But then you have a projection, what if you take phi uh, to be just the identity, so projection minus one of the identity. Well, what you get is just this space here of function. So they are this weight. So the so yeah, and this so this so this is a subgroup. It's identified with function with weighted function, and they are called super translation. Okay. Uh, so in general, what you have is that you have this so. Super translation, super 
translation are canonically injected into this BMS. Right? And, you can, and you have a canonical projection over a conformal transformation of stigma. Okay, this is, of course, tightly related to this inner product uh, structure. What else do you want to say about this? Uh, yes, and also super translation, they are identified with this weight one function, which means that you can do something. <coughs> So let's let's look at this, this subspace of super translation. Ah, yeah, so first of all, BMS4, I should say. So this is a very somewhat general setting. What really people have in mind when they say something like BMS4, what they really mean is this is this BMS group I, I discussed just now with sigma is the two sphere. Okay. And then it's then it's clear that this is because now the conformal group of the of the two sphere is SO31. Um, and now there is a nice fact is that we can, um, there, are, there are ways, many ways actually, but to, to put the Poincare group in there. So how do you do this? Um, yes, so if you want fact, if you look at the subspace of, fun of weighted function L, such that uh, F minus two H as constant, constant curvature. So you have a space of weight, this gate three scaled by lambda one, this is weight two, so this is a metric. You can look at well, how much of them are constant curvature. This is, this is canonically, this is a vector space and this is canonically identified with R31. So you always have this R31 sitting inside the super translations, just because this, this constant curvature scales, they always feel fit into this weight one scales. Uh, which means that <coughs> that you, know, you can embed ISO 31, which is R31 times the conform time ISO 31. Uh, and embed it into this BMS4. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, this, uh, this is getting to the end, so I have uh, to, to, to rush. But of course, the problem is that there is nothing unique about this embedding. Because the way you do it is that you choose a trivialization. So by, you make a choice, you choose, you choose a trivialization, and this is the way you can identify. Uh, in general, it doesn't make sense. So I mean, R31 is always canonically embedding in here, but at the point I group is not. So you always have this subspace of super translation, which are just usual translation, but you cannot embed Poincaré uniquely in there. Okay, so let me... Do you have any question on this structure I had to do? Yes? If you wanted to include not just uh, the right transformations and super translations, but also super rotations or defects too, how do you have to change your uh, general definition so, uh, of PMS? So you see, if you, the super rotation in the same domain, I think you just, you, what you can take is you take sigma, or uh, sigma is just some open space, and then conformal transformation and uh, super rotation. So the only reason why super rotation become SO31 is because the code is when this, because the sphere is non topological, non -topological okay, because you exclude the singular one. Yes. And, uh, if you want the super rotation, the same that all the more transformations, they are just open for more transformations. So you just, just let sigma to be an open space. And if you want the full, it's true. If you want the full, you need to, you need to, to declare that you don't care about the form. So the problem, or you have the way to be uh, okay, let me, if I have five minutes left, and just, yes, uh, I'd like to now comment on the notion of gravity vacuum. Let me make a little of this.
Okay, so in the first part of the lecture, I sort of hopefully try to convince you that there is this homogeneous space, which is there around homogeneous space for the Poincare group. And I want, I want to call it a uh, gravity, uh, gravity vacuum. Okay, so this is cry back. This is just this homogeneous space. Now, the trouble is that if you just pick a general informal Carian geometry, so it's cry HN, as we just saw, the automorphism group is BMS, is not Poincare group. So there is, and if, so if you're looking for maps, uh, how should I call them, phi, okay, phi psi, from uh, this model, from, from, your, from your conformal Carian geometry to, to the, the monal space, they are not unique. They are not unique precisely because there is no unique way of embedding the Poincare group inside BMS. There are many ways of doing this, 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 uh, this map. So therefore, you want to call gravity vector, the space of gravity vector, as being the space of such maps. So they are the space of psi going from scry hn to iso 3 1. There are many, infinitely many, actually. <clears throat> um, again, motivation is that this is a vacuum of Minkowski space because this is the boundary of Minkowski space, and, but conformal Carian geometry is too weak to, to, to give you a disidentification, so you have this moduli. Um, yeah, of course, implicitly here, I'm, re I'm, re I'm requiring that this, this psi should be an isomorphism of conformal Carian manifold, right? There is, there is there is a conformal Carian man in a geometry induced here, canonical. I want this, this psi to be an isomorphism of this structure. Uh, so, fact, proposition, that in fact, the BMS group acts transitively, so BMS4 acts transitively on this space of gravity vacua, on gravity vacua. Therefore, you can, you can realize uh, gravity vacua. As, as the quotient BMS4, but the stabilizer is obviously just the Poincare group. And so you can think of this gravity as being this moduli. Okay, so I'm nearly done. Okay, um, so this is the notion of gravity back here. Some, I think, important remark. What should I do here? Is the, something that, which at this stage would be obvious, but I think it's somewhat understated in the literature. Uh, so by the way, we, we, have, we already have two definitions of gravity vacua. Gravity vacua are the space of maps. They are also uh, this quotient, but then it's also clear by, by I can write this by, 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 so Andreas told us in the very first lecture that this is a very basic fact of Carton geometry that such maps, they are precisely equivalent to flat Carton connection. Modeled on ISO 31 divided by P. Okay, so it's absolutely just, just fundamental result of Carton geometry. Local isomorphism to your model are one-to-one -one correspondence with flat Carton connection. Um, so yeah, so I think, so what you have, what we have here is three gravity vacua expression, which are clearly all the same. Um, so yeah, no, and so that, I think I would like to conclude with the following remarks. So it's clear that at this stage you're wondering, okay, now gravity vacua, uh, they are choice of flat Carton connections. What if I try to, con to consider Carton connections which are not flat? Now, surely I do not have a gravity vacua there, so I do not have gravity vacua, so there is something in my space time. There's something what can it be? Well, there needs to, well, the only answer is that this has to be gravitational radiation. And this is, okay, and so, did, so, um, so next week in my research talk, I will show you that indeed you can really take this point of view and that it's perfectly coherent. There always is at the boundary of this uh, asymptotically flat space time, there is only a preferred Carton connection. In general, 
it's not flat. You have some curvature, and the curvature is an invariant way of talking about the gravitational radiation getting, getting there. When it's flat, you have a gravity vacua, and therefore you have this isomorphism just by this obvious fact. So you sort of, sort of interesting picture. So I think that I'm done with the lecture. Thank you. Questions? Um, I would like to ask if you uh, is there anything specifically two dimensional here? No. So, uh, yes, no. So, there is not in the sense that it always you can run all these things in any dimension. For example, this definition here is nowhere, in the, nowhere up here. Um, at this level, you also have, don't have much. You just, you know, if you can replace this by any sphere, and you'll get, you will get uh, the sphere. But I mean, the different, of course, if you're, if you're just working with some local neighborhood, of course, conformal transformation is dimensional. Are all transformation? So locally, something different is happening, but globally, so, I mean, at the level of this flat model, everything runs through in any dimension. There is no, no, no dimension problem. When you try to curve the model, then, then there would be some very critical difference between the dimensions at the flat level. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, can you, uh, in, so in, in higher dimensions, or maybe in four dimensions, can you uh, use this structure uh, in the curve case to yes. to um, uh, give a condition for the absence of, of gravitational radiation at infinity. Yes, yes and also, yes, you can generalize this in any dimension, but gravitational radiation in higher dimensions, they, they, they are at lowest order. So we're not going to see. So in a sense, this picture, in this flat, this curved Cartan connection is going to really see the, the very first jets of your mind. And in four dimensions, it just happened that gravitational radiation they are, they are precisely at this order. But in higher dimension, they, they are much lower uh, in, in the expansions. You are not going to capture them by such construction. You, you would actually see it if you're trying to you know, if you forget about space time, you're just working on this conformal Carlian geometry, if you're trying to run your Carton procedure, you just see it. It's just going to keep in your head that somewhere there's something crucial going on. Uh, or three dimensional conformal no, we do not get gravitational radiation through this procedure. Well, I mean, for absence of gravitational radiation. We just not see them. Ah, so, so okay. perhaps your question. Ah, okay, okay. So, okay. so no, there is something happening, but it's not related to gravitational radiation. And I was mentioned there is something that is not gravitational radiation. So, this something is that you always. Do. So, so this conformal power and manifold, in any dimension, they are too weak to define point by group. In any dimension, you always have the GML group in this sense. Any dimension, you can run your Cartan argument trying to find the Cartan connection which you wanted, you know, trying to pick point I group for you, and you see that there is some freedom. There is a gravity that in any dimension in this sense. However, and you can, however, yeah, however, it's not related to gravitational radiation is what I want to say. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks. It's only in four dimensions that this gravitational radiation gets entangled with this. Other questions? Um, and this, with this uh, gravity vacuum, do you need actually groups so you can, uh, do you need like, can you go to vector fields, just local story? Yeah, this is completely local. All of this is. I don't need completeness of those vector fields. Okay. Then, it depends, it depends on how much you care about physics. I mean, in all this is what I've been discussing, really everything is local. You, can, you could work on the open set and everything. Of course, if you do actually care about it, if you want to think of this uh, the whole power in the manifold at the boundary of subspace time, definitely you can yeah, you start it. completely global, right? Yeah. You start completely global, right? But there are groups that, that yeah. like just working on this area. Yeah, I mean, I make some assumptions because even the topological assumption in some sense. You can weaken a lot of things in terms of, of, of how general you want to go. I mean, in terms of the local geometry, every, in terms of the geometry, everything is local. Of course, you can you start to care about the physics. Local um, structure is very important. <laughs> this, I mean, this automorphism group makes sense whether or not uh, you have, even if you have five of them or not, it's always there, this automorphism group. So you can always, uh, it can be very small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can be big, right? Uh, 
автоморфизм групп кандесмол. Это визируем. Это не визируем. 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 Визиру